and it wasn't just like a drop it was like <gasps> like the uncontrollable like <sighs> and he 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 looks at me puts his hand on my shoulder he leans in he says it's nice to see you sam he says and oh by the way get used to hearing that and so that began this journey of what it means to be seen what it means to be vulnerable what it means to be real what it means to care what it means to matter and know that you matter Welcome to the Talking Shop Podcast, where I'm here to share stories, lessons, and experiences in sports performance and professional development. Today, I'm joined by Sam Acha, the guy who does it all. How are you doing today? I'm good, dude. How are you? Oh, I'm fantastic. I'm ready to get after it. So, Sam, I'm going to try to I'm gonna try to do you justice with everything that you have done, are doing, and will be doing, but here's a little list I've accumulated. He's a father, author, husband, motivational storyteller, humanitarian, NFL linebacker. He's the author of the book. Let the world see you, how to be real in a world full of fakes. I'm about halfway through, which if that title doesn't get you to kind of take a step back, I don't know what will. He played football at the University of Texas, was a fourth round draft pick by the Cardinals, played for the Bears. He's a DN in college, played outside linebacker for nine, 10 years in the NFL. Taking a breath. Uh, he got, he won the William V. Campbell Award, which is, uh, or trophy, which is the top scholar athlete in college football, the Werfel Trophy for community service. He was a finalist for the lot trophy which is the impact defensive player of the year which is an acronym he was named sporting news top 20 smartest athletes he tackled ben roethlisberger joe flacco carson wentz intercepted a pass intended for adrian peterson intercepted eli manning was voted one of the 10 smartest players in the nfl was twice nominated as the bears walter payton nfl man of the year award he was the vice president of the nfl pa he got his mba from the number one international uh mba program in the world he takes annual mission trips to nigeria He's the founder and president of Athletes for Justice, which is a platform for pro athletes to help fight systemic injustice. Uh, author, he's, he does broadcasting on ESPN and other places like that. And he was voted one of the six uh, NFL players with genius IQs. He's fluent in English, Spanish, and Ingbu. Did I say that correct? Ebo. 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 Uh, so did I miss anything? I think you got more than more than what we needed. <laughs> <laughs> and he also did some podcast stuff as well. Hence the super nice mic, super nice setup. So, all right. Now that that's out of the way. So I sent you the questions that I usually ask my guests. But as I was kind of going through your book and doing my homework, there were some things that I had to get out there. So first, I have six speed round questions. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right. So if you and your bro were at a throwing pit right now throwing the shot in discus, who'd win? I'd win in shot. He'd win in disc. All right. Who's your favorite I'd Pokemon? I'd kill him in shot. I'd destroy him in shot. You favorite Pokemon? Him in shot? Charizard. You, Charizard? Pokemon? Classic. Yeah, Charizard. Hands Classic. Down. Yeah. Uh, I, like, I like, like Dragonair too, but Charizard was a Snorlax was pretty fire. Snorlax. <laughs> you know what I mean? If you could capture a Snorlax, dude, your life would, my life would change. If I could ever capture a Snorlax, I was like a big Pokemon Red. I know, I know this is speed round, but. I was like a Pokemon. I think Pokemon Red was my thing. My brother did Pokemon Blue. And if I ever could catch a Snorlax, bro, like I'd automatically win. Like that's all you need. You got yeah. so many HP. Anyways, <laughs> I digress. And it's interesting you said Dragonair. My favorite is Dragon Knight. So Ooh. I like your style. I like your okay. style. Respect. Uh, who's better at chess, you or Larry Fitzgerald? Me. Um, well, we, we haven't played that many times. We would need to play again. We would need to play again. I, I would say me. He would say him. I don't remember how our matchups went. So we need a, we need another match. Gotcha. Gotcha. It's, it's out there in the, in the universe. Yeah. Do you remember the first thing you said to Bill Clinton? Probably it's an honor to meet you. I, so I just casual. remember. Yeah. I got, no, I wasn't, I was in awe. I was in shock. I was like, uh, uh, probably my name is S -S -S Sam. Like I was, <laughs> you know, like I, can I tell the story now? Maybe it'll, after the speed round, I'll tell the story later. Uh, what's your Chipotle order? Ooh, okay, it's changed. I'm gonna give you two. Okay. When okay. I was like in big train mode and big, like, okay, I gotta get big and strong, put on weight. It would be a burrito, um, rice, usually white rice, double chicken, onions, peppers. I don't usually do the beans. I'll do sour cream. Hit the hit the depends what kind of mood I'm in. Hot sauce, the little sauce salsa, guac, corn, and 
usually I might hit like chips and salsa. But actually, I wouldn't eat chips and salsa with that. Or that was when I was like trying to like get big and strong. And then after a while, it kind of deteriorated to a bowl with brown rice and lettuce. Like actually, no, it deteriorated. No, it, I guess it maybe elevated to like a salad. So it'd be in a bowl. And I said, can I get a salad? They put the lettuce in there. Then I get a little bit of chicken on there and rice. So I kind of had to change my diet because I started, I, I was getting, I was big enough. And then uh, last one. So free is free is a theme a lot in your book. What is one of those little cheap, tiny things that you've accumulated that you still like talk about, you love, you use to this day? Oh, that's a great question. There's so many, like to me, they're not little, you know what I mean? Like the Chipotle card wasn't a little thing. That was a huge thing where I got free Chipotle for, for a year, the movie tickets to watch movies for, for pre-screenings. Like those were the dopest ones. The only thing that sucked about that was that as I, you know, got married and had kids and like my desires changed from watching movies all day to wanting to hang out with my wife and kids. So like, they still email me about, about movie pre-screenings, but I just don't go anymore because I'm like, ah, it's seven o'clock and that dinner time. And so, so yeah, I'll say yeah. the movie, the movie, the movie pre-screenings are pretty dope. Those are pretty dope. Or like your favorite little thing you bought for like under 10 bucks. I mean, if it's under 10, I'm trying to get it for free, bro. <laughs> to, you know what I mean? So, um, the hustle's real. The hustle is real. Like if it's under 10, I'm trying to think things that I really appreciate and enjoy. Cause for me, Dude, it's this, this little... ring, your ring, it's this ring. Yeah. So like this ring. I don't know if y'all can see it on the thing. This is my wedding ring, wedding band. So I, maybe y'all can see it. My finger is like jammed, swollen because of football. I jammed it. I think I maybe broke some stuff in there. And so I had this ring, this gold actual like wedding ring that wouldn't fit on my finger anymore. And so I had to figure out how do I go and find a ring that I can wear that'll fit. And so I found these are like eight bucks, six bucks for a pack of like five and like free is free. And so, yes, dude, so you can wear them working out. You can exchange them different colors. And so, or not exchange them, you can interchange them. And so, yeah, th this wedding band that I can wear while I lift and, and, and do all my things. And now it just stays with me because it's just easier to fit on my swollen finger from playing football. Yeah. Yeah. Sweet. Mine's this like $10 wireless mouse on Amazon. Like I don't know how this is only 10 bucks, you know, but let's get super excited about it. Yes. So you're definitely speaking my language. Yes, um, yes. I saw something the other day. I'm I'm thinking out loud right now. Oh, dude, there are these. I wish I had it with me. It's like these cleaner. Like we got kids and they drew my, my two year old was drawing on the wall, like on the wall. Yes. With this crayon. I'm like, I'm like, we're thinking about moving. And I'm after like repaint the place and all these things. So I went to Home Depot to get some paint and dude at Home Depot was like, dude, there are these magic erase things it's like a sponge but it literally is like magic and so it's like six bucks and so i got it and literally i was literally cleaning all you know all night one night i'm like this is a miracle but like, this is this is amazing this is like magic like this is what the you know like it literally just one wipe and it was gone and so i was so happy so that recently is what i'm excited about sweet sweet so to to recap as a, a shot record holder an avid charizard fan Someone who's pretty solid at chess. We'll have to hear this, this Bill Clinton story and evolving Chipotle order and a bargain hunter. So what is this? Uh, that's Sam Acha right there. So what's this uh, Bill Clinton story? Well, well, so interestingly enough, like when you get to the NFL, so I played linebacker for nine years in, in the NFL, and you would think like you're, you're, you're the hero, right? You're the guy. Everybody loves you. And to a certain extent, that's true. But when I got to the NFL, I was around people who – were like superheroes you know what I mean like if I'm a hero that's a superhero like it was like like Larry Fitzgerald was one of the guys on my team and in, he's gonna go in the Hall of Fame obviously and you know he was just a guy in the locker room who people would ask me my friends from college would ask me about all the time dude how cool is it playing with Fitz and you know how what is he like and I'd be like oh he's the man he's so cool we hang out all the time we didn't hang out or talk at all but I was like oh he's so cool and then finally, like after like a year, like six months of like pretending that we were friends, one of my friends from college was like, dude, just talk to him. Because I was like, I really don't know the guy. He's like, just talk to him. I was like, no, but that's like, this is Larry Fitzgerald. He's like, dude, just have a conversation. And so one day I approach him. It was in the off season before my second year. And I had noticed that he just loves, maybe love's not the right word. He cares a lot of what, of how he's viewed. That's just what I noticed, right? Everyone, ha every, everyone has their thing. Some people are like, oh, I love my beard. Oh, I hey, love your beard, right? Some people, it's like, man, I look the way I dress, right? Yeah, you're sharing the beard, right? Uh -huh. So Fitz just cares. He cared a ton about, like, how people viewed him for whatever reason, right? Neither here nor there. 
And so I said, man, I know what will get his attention. And so I went up to him one day and I said, hey, Fitz. He said, hey, what's up, man? I don't know if you knew my name. And I, I said, hey, man, people come up to me all the time, which is true. They call me friends from high school, from college, and they would ask me what kind of guy you are. And he was like, well, what do you, like, they, he, he said, I said, they would ask me, like, are you as nice of a guy as you see him on TV? Are you, like, why do you do all the good things that you do? The great, amazing things in the community, like, you care about people. And he said, well, what would you tell them? And I'll say, I, I told him, I, I don't know why you do what you do. I don't know if you're a good guy. I don't know anything about you. He's like, bro, why don't you just lie and tell him, you know, tell him something, you know? And he was like, dude, just get to know me. Why don't you just take some time and get to know me? And so that developed this really cool relationship where we became friends. You talked about it. We would, he, I'd go to his house. I was going to say we would go to each other's houses. I had a little townhouse in the little, you know, in the boonies. He had a, fits at his house. And so we'd play chess. We'd hang out. And one night, the night before one of our toughest practices, which is usually the Wednesday practice, I got a text from Fitz. <clears throat> and that text was about halfway through the season. I had just earned a starting spot and we were on this run trying to win some games, maybe make a playoff push. And he texted me, said, hey, what are you doing tomorrow night after practice? And I'm thinking, okay, well, maybe I need to tell him I'm watching film so I'm ready for the game or tell him I'm, you know, I'll be ex getting an extra workout in. But as I reread the text, it looked more like an invitation than a in inquisition. Like it didn't look like he was trying to figure me out. He like, looked like he was trying to invite me somewhere. And so I said, I said, honestly, dude, I'm not doing anything. I'm chilling. He said, okay, cool. Well, bring tomorrow. I want you to meet some friends of mine bring something nice because I want you to dress to impress. Thumbs up. That's all the thumbs up emoji was literally all I did. I didn't want to ask. I didn't know. And so, but I couldn't wait. I couldn't wait because it was Fitz and he's inviting me to hang out. I'm like, well, who's the friend? And so I, I, I dressed in my normal clothes to go to practice, but I brought like this nice suit with me. And then, so like we're going through practice and like, I'm, I would like guard him sometimes like in our zone coverage and like, after the play, I'm like, Fitz, who is it? Who is it? You know, he's like, chill, chill, wait. You know, I'm a, I'm a rookie. I'm trying to, you know. And so we finished practice. I, I couldn't wait till it was over. I go I go to the locker room. I shower real quick, change real quick, and I'm ready. I'm waiting. I'm like, all right, what's the deal? Where are we going? Where are we going? He said, just wait. So I, I, I followed him in my car. Maybe I hopped in the car with, with him. It was like two or three of us, maybe four. And we're driving. And we get to this hotel. This, and there's like this big event going on. I don't know, I don't know what it is. And he's like, just follow me. And so I follow him. It's, like I said, it's like four of us following him. So I follow him and we go like, through this crowd and then we go down these steps and then we go to this like, back room and then we go like, down some other steps, cross the other side. And then there's this, like, the, like you know, the black curtains. Then we go like behind this curtain and there are some round tables and we just, sit down. He says, hey, just, just sit, hang out over there. And I'm like, okay, what the heck? Like, are, is this like mission impossible? Like what is going on? And so we're sitting, we're waiting and he, he's sitting down as well. And there's like this dude with this earpiece in his ear, just standing there. Like, you know, like, just kind of like, and he taps me, Fitz taps me and he says, you know, who that is. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know. Am I supposed to like, he says, that's president Clinton's body guy. We're about to meet the president. And I'm like, what president? Like the pre a, a, not even the a president. Like I don't even care. He's like, yeah, it's his body guy. He said, like, go go talk to him. I'm like, why would I talk to him? He's like, trust me. Like that's how you get to know people. Go talk to him. So I'm like, all right, cool. So I go and just kind of introduce myself and start having a conversation. And I go back and I'm like, it's really his body guy. It's really, you know, it's like, duh, it, you know. And so I'm sitting down, and then we're kind of just talking and kind of joking a little bit. And all of a sudden, the door is open to this back room, there's like a side door and President Clinton walked in. And when I say you could feel the weight of his presence in the room, it, it just felt like royalty. Like immediately everyone, the five of us like got up on our feet and shook his hand. It's almost like we almost like bowed down. Like this, it was just, it just like there was this aura about him. Some people have that. And so I was just excited to see a president like 
this is so cool. We sit down, we kind of start talking a little bit, and it turns out that President Clinton and Larry Fitzgerald know each other because Larry's a big advocate for one of the president's initiatives called the Starkey Hearing Foundation, where they go all around different countries and give out hearing aids to people in need. And so I'm listening to this and hearing about their relationship, and all of a sudden, Fitz stops the president mid conversation. And he says, Hey, uh, Mr. President, so Sam here, Sam's family is from Nigeria. They go there all the time doing medical missions trips. Sam, tell the president about your trips. It's like five of us at the table. And I'm like, uh, uh, my, yeah, tri- Sam is a trip. My name. Yeah. And I'm like, and I start, so I start telling him about the medical mission trips that my family and I do every single summer in Nigeria. We bring doctors and nurses, surgeons, dentists, ophthalmologists, pharmacists, pediatricians from all around the United States and take them to rural villages in Nigeria to give out free medical care. And, and I told him how my parents were born and raised in Nigeria. They immigrated to the United States and they started building this life. They didn't forget about their family. Like we're talking and talk, like I'm sharing this for like probably 20, 30 minutes. Like just me and the president. And he's talking about his time in Nigeria and the people there and all the things. And I'm like, this is nuts. And we're talking. And the next thing you know, the door opens again. And, um, and it's President George Bush. And I was like, wait, what? Is this a movie? Like, what is going on? I'm being punk. Like, what's going on? And, and it wasn't the same aura as Pre- like President Clinton. It was like, oh, President Bush, it was like, hey, what's up? What's up, my dude? Like, it, like, he's so, he was so laid back, so chill. He comes, he sits down. I got some pictures. I can, you know, maybe if I can find it, I'll show it or send it to you. He, he sits down and we're talking, talking, talking. And it turns out that President, I'm going to see if I can find that picture. It turns out that President Bush was next door neighbors. He's from Texas. I'm from Texas. Next door neighbors with one of my classmates from, from high school. And turns out he's a University of Texas fan. Here's a picture. I don't know if people could see it. Me hey, and Bush. Yeah. And then I'll go the uh here's the one with me and Clinton. Oh. And then I'll go to the one with us sitting down. Here's the let me turn it sideways. It's hard to see probably here, but there's like the yeah. Clinton, yeah. Bush, and Fitz, and then like the seven or eight of us. Yeah. You know, total just sitting there. And and we just start talking and we, we got them jerseys, you know, the Cardinal, you know, 42, 43. And, and we just start talking and he's talking about Texas and all these things. And like, they're like, all right, guys, we got to go. We're going to go speak at this thing. This is what the, we're here for. I'm like, oh, sweet. So they get up and they're like, and they're like, hey, we got some seats reserved for you. And I'm like, wait, what? So they go, they go and they kind of get situated. I'm still freaking out. Like, this is not real. And then Fitz is like, hey, come on, let's go sit down. And so we go and we sit down and the, the table that we're at says on it, reserved for guests of the president. And VIP. I'm like, VIP, like I'm the guest. And so I sit down and they start, they, it's like a Q&A conversation thing. And halfway through, and this is kind of like all the other stuff was cool. But halfway through this speech in front of a thousand, however many people, a question gets brought up about maybe immigration or something. And then Clinton's like, hey, well, I just met a dude named Sam Macho whose parents are like the model for what it looks like, what immigration looks like. They can't, you know, he starts talking about my parents. And then as he's talking about this story in front of all these people, President, uh, so Clinton said that, then Bush hops in, he says, and he's a longhorn, hook him horn, you know? And so like, it was a super cool, just experience opportunity. We followed them. They were going on, they were doing some maybe campaigning or I don't know what they were doing. So we followed them in like the secret service car afterwards. And it was just a really, really cool experience. So we stayed in touch. I, I stayed in touch with that assistant guy, his body guy. I went to did some stuff with the Clinton Global Initiative. I sent President Bush a, a book and he's, you know, he, he sent me a letter saying, thank you. Like, so, so one of my books, Let the World See. So if you read, if you go and buy, Let the World See You, you know, it's on Amazon, it's, it's on Amazon and uh, Target, wherever you want, you know, where you get Audible. President Bush read that as well. So just know that. I asked Clinton as well, but I think he was busy and there was some politics stuff going on. I said, okay, we're good. Yeah, that's, that's great. So I think that's the second chapter of your book. Super, super cool story. I was waiting for you to say that he like called you on stage to come talk about it, but no, I mean, I, I wouldn't have even like, I was just like, he asked me to, to like stand up and wave. Like he's like, Sam, you know, Sam, why are you stand up? So I stand up, I, I stood up and I just kind of waved and I was like, what is going on? This is ridiculous, you know? And 
I didn't even need to be on stage, but the fact that they remembered my name, like that's what blew me away the most. And then twofold, one, I was like, okay, maybe politicians have a gift of remembering people's names, but gift or no gift, the fact that they remembered my name and my story, it blew me away. And that, that right there went with me a really long way. Yeah, yeah. And speaking of that, kind of, I forgot in the intro because I was so excited. How we know each other is my boss trained Sam because he played uh, for the Bears and he was in Chicago. They got connected. And as I was kind of reading your book and you referenced uh, just a few of the quotes that like already stuck out to me was that you got a hard time for caring so much about fans and taking the time to get to know them and chat with them. And you just came in one day to, so I, I shot the video of you and Tommy for 10 Motion. But you came in to like do your, your lift on your own one day. And then we just chatted for like 15 minutes or so after. And like, I just remember I was like, kind of like not taking it back, but I was just like, those are like some really in, intentional questions, like just trying to get to know me better. And then you just reference how like you have just the ability to do that and that smile, you know. Um, so that's kind of how we know each other in some context and how I got I got you on the podcast. So definitely get the book. Like I said, I'm halfway through and there's there's a few other things about like, um, when you started wearing a dark face mask and long sleeves when you were allergic to exercise. And so that's just a little teaser, just a little teaser. So uh, three other things that I definitely wanted to ask to kind of take advantage of, of our podcast. So what was your process of just like whittling down all of these stories you've accumulated over, you know, your time in college, time in the NFL, and then a little bit after? You mean to put like why why these specific stories are in this book? Yeah, was it like a whiteboard and you'd erase and then you'd have sticky notes and arrows and stuff, or just how did you select all of them? <laughs> well, dude, so so it was 2018 and I just signed a multi-year, multi-million dollar contract, first time ever, right? All my other, I've been playing in the NFL for seven years, which is already a long career, but most of my contracts had been veteran minimum, like bottom like maybe you'll make the team maybe you won't I ended up like making the team and starting a good amount of time but it was never security and I just got this perceived security and it just wasn't what I expected like I thought oh I'm gonna get this contract and like get my validation and all my problems will go away and it seemed as if the opposite happened happened I got the contract and it wasn't like I got the validation that I felt like I deserved it was almost like oh no now I really got to perform. Now I really got to show them. If I, if I was putting on a mask and pretending to be a superhero before, now I really got to like be extraordinary now. And some of that pressure, it was just too much to carry. And it wasn't just that because of that contract. I had been carrying a lot of weight trying to perform and have all the answers and be the guy that I thought everybody wanted. I had been carrying that weight for a long time. And so when I got what I thought that was going to make me free of the expectations, it in fact did the opposite and it almost entrapped me to expectations. Uh, one of my friends, he says, if you live for their acceptance, you'll die from their rejection. I had been living for people's acceptance for a long time. And I got this contract and it's like, it wasn't like I was more accepted. It was like, oh, they could reject me even sooner. So I remember I was just kind of struggling mentally, emotionally, even spiritually, like, man, what is going on? Like, you know, I, I'm, 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 a, I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm like, I, I pray, I, you know, I'm, I've, I've spent time like reading the word of God, uh, reading the Bible, going to church. Like, and I was like, kind of just like, what is going on? And so I remember a week before training camp, 2018, excuse me, I was just struggling. And I remember sitting down with a friend. I just came from Cincinnati where I was training for a bit for a couple of weeks to Chicago. And I sat down with one of my friends and I was like, dude, like, I don't know what's going on, but I feel like I'm not being like the man that I was supposed to be, the friend, the husband, the father. Like, I feel like I'm just not being anything of who I thought I was, who I am, who I am. I'm not being me. And I remember almost like, not almost like breaking down into tears, like starting to cry in front of this, this dude. And this dude had never seen me cry. This is one of my friends for like eight years. I've known him since 2012. 
we helped, he helped me start businesses and do different things. And, and he'd never seen this side of me. And I remember starting to cry and being like, man, maybe I said, maybe I, I just need to get back to football. We start training camp in a week. It's been a long off season. I've, I've, I've been by myself, no friends, no teammates. When I get back to football, that's when everything will be okay. And this friend of mine looked at me and he said, Sam, if that's how you feel right now, I'm concerned about what happens when football ends for you. For when you retire, when it's taken away, I'm actually concerned. And as he's saying this, like it really starts to hit me more and I'm weeping even more and like trying to wipe my tears away. But he stops me and he says, oh, by the way, it's really nice to see you. And I look at him like, this, these tears, this not, this, this, what I just told you about how I feel like I'm failing in all facets of life. Nice to see. He said, yeah, it's good to see and know that you're human. He said, I've never seen this side of you, but it's really nice to see. And he said, maybe, just maybe, this is what he told me to your question. He said, maybe God is writing a book in your life and you may only be on chapter two. In my mind, I said, if you know what I've been through, this is not chapter two. This feels like it's three books already. He said, you may only be on chapter two. And he recommended, he's like, I don't know if you've done it before, but maybe you go talk to a counselor. Like this dude was actually in Chicago to talk to a, uh, a therapist guy doing like a life plan, right? His, it, you know, he, his, you know, his wife had just got cancer and like, it wasn't something that he had planned. And he said, maybe you talk to the guy. And so I said, all right, cool. So I called the dude, the counselor guy, and his only availability, his first availability was a week later, which was the day we reported a training camp. Chicago Bears training camp is in Bourbon, Illinois, about two hours, maybe south. I don't know where compared, two hours away from, from where I lived. So that mor we report in the evening. That morning that we reported, I'm the starter, I'm the guy, I'm supposed to, you know, contract. I was sitting, sitting in a counselor's office about an hour north and we're talking and I figure, okay, let me, I'm an achiever. I'm a competitor. Let me just check the box, get in and get out. And so we're talking a little bit and then he stops me. He says, Hey, Sam, I have a question for you. I'm like, shoot. You know, he said, he said, I've seen you, you know, we've been talking for a little bit. I just want to ask you a quick question. He, he said, what do you do when you get angry? You talked about it before, Matt, the smile. I was like, oh, you know what? It's easy. I, I just try not to get angry. He says, I'll ask you again, what do you do when you get angry? And I responded again. I said, I just try not to get angry. He looked at me again. He says, Sam, Sam, everybody gets angry. So what do you do when you get angry? And out of nowhere, I just started to break down into tears. And it wasn't just like a drop. It was like, <gasps> like the uncontrollable, like, <sighs> and he, he, he looks at me, he puts his hand on my shoulder. He leans in, he says, it's nice to see you, Sam. And he says, and oh, by the way, get used to hearing that. And so that began this journey of what it means to be seen, what it means to be vulnerable, what it means to be real, what it means to care, what it means to matter and know that you matter. And so when it came to this book and so much more happened from that point forward, from chapter two, if you will, forward so much. So like my, I, you know, we, we were pregnant with our, our youngest and my wife had some complications after the baby were, and she almost didn't make it. So that happened a few weeks after that, I, we, we trade for Khalil Mack. I'm so, this is finally my year. The guy we trade for Khalil Mack at rele relegated to the bench. A few weeks after that, I tear my pec out for the season. A few weeks after that, one of my mentors, a next door neighbor, when I lived in Arizona died from cancer. A few, a few months after that, excuse me, a few, all in the same season of life, a season of football, forget life football. A few weeks after that, my wife's wallet gets stolen, which 
seems inconsequential, but it'll matter in a second. Right after that, our house floods. While we were at the Super Bowl, uh, watching, we went playing, watching Super Bowl house floods. And then a little bit after that, my wife and I were supposed to take a five-year anniversary. My wife and I were supposed to take a five-year anniversary trip to South Korea because my MBA, it's an international MBA, and I had a friend who was teaching there. And she said, hey, can you come and speak to the business school? Because I'm, I'm a speaker. And can you come and do a football camp? And I said, sure. Can you, you, know, can you figure out accommodation? She's like, I got you. And so I had a trip planned for my wife and I, five-year anniversary, babysitting, all the stuff was set up. And her wallet was stolen. My wife is from Nigeria. She wasn't a U.S. citizen at the time. So her green card, her U.S. citizenship was in that wallet that was stolen. We actually had went to Atlanta where the Super Bowl was to try and get a new one, like a new passport. Their machine was broken. Like, so we, it was just nothing was working. And so I actually went by myself because she was like, you committed, you got to go. So I go by myself and I was like, I'll just go for a day if I need to, too. Like we were supposed to spend a week, I'll do a day. I go, I speak, I do the football camp. And mind you, like all this stuff had happened and it was, it just seemed like I didn't have a chance to slow down. And I remember doing the camp, speaking at the business school and my friend who was in Korea, she had all this stuff set up for me and my wife, like a spa and a hotel and dinner reservations at the best place. And she was like, hey, I didn't, cause she didn't know if she was gonna be able to make it or not. Last minute decision is the passport gonna come in. She said, hey, this stuff is still available. If you want to go, I don't know. You know, I said, I'm, I'm just gonna chill. I'm just gonna chill. So I went to sleep that night and God woke me up in the middle of the night. There's no better, I don't know how else to say it. God woke me up in, in the middle of the night and I just started to write. Like I picked up a pen and a pad that was right in the hotel lobby. Some, similar to this, like just a little pad, pen, pad. And I just started to write what was on my heart. I was right. And I, as I was writing, I was writing about death and loss and fear and love and success and failure and pain. And I was writing and writing and writing. I think I was finally just processing all that had happened. And I came back from that trip and I think I'd posted some stuff on social media of what I was writing and the response was really strong. But I came back from that trip and I hit up my friend, I reached out to my friend and I said, Oh, and oh, by the way, I forgot to mention this. Two weeks before that trip, one year into my two-year contract, I got released by the Chicago Bears. So that happened as well. I come back from that trip. I reach out to my friend and I said, hey, remember that book you were talking about? He's like, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, what do, you, what do you mean? I said, remember when you, you said I was probably on chapter two? I said, he said, yeah. I said, I think I'm on chapter 12 right now. So if you got like an agent or something, like, let me know. And so he put me in touch with a book agent. And, and, and what I mean by that, I really do. Like, it wasn't like it was all written out in, on paper, but it was written out in my heart. Like what needed to be said, what it means to be seen, to be known, to be loved, to be real, to be human. We all experience it. And I just needed personally to let my story out and I knew people would, would benefit from it. And so that's what the book is. Let the world see you, my book, let the world see you how to be real in a world full of fakes. It's a story about what it means to be seen and to be known, to be loved. Yeah. To be loved. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And there, there's a quote kind of about that book you talking about is, you know, always being the guy who had all the answers. And that, that hit me personally. And I'm sure a lot of the, my audience can relate just being professionals in sports performance. Chances are that they were a pretty decent athlete themselves. So in high school, you know, everyone was a varsity player. I got good grades. I, I walked on to a, a college baseball team. we made it to the world series. You know, I was the president of two clubs, the treasurer of another one. I did all this other stuff, research, et cetera, et cetera. And like, it was kind of like easy for me to do. Like I went to tough high school, you know, just this area. And it was like my junior year. And 
I was like looking at grad schools and I was doing baseball and all of my clubs and, you know, I had like a four Oh and all this stuff. And I got like, like kind of depressed for a month. And my girlfriend at the time, um, she was just like, she was like, dude, like, you're just like, ah, I'm like, no, nah, I'm good. She's like, she's like, homie. <laughs> well, she didn't say homie, but you know, that's how I talk. She goes like, no, like, like you're acting different. And then, and then I just, I was like, I've just always been the man, you know, like I've always had it figured out. She's like, who says you have to be the man? I'm like, I do, you know? So that just definitely like hit me in my, in my heartstrings, just like, you know, just all the stuff that you've done from high school to college to, you know, the pros and now beyond. And, um, and like, it's just, that just really resonated with me. And I feel like a lot of people can relate to that having always been putting themselves on a pedestal, but also kind of to others as well, you know, like what percentage of all football players ever, um, have played in, in the NFL, you know, there's, there's a stat about the MLB, you could fill half of an MLB stadium with all of the MLB players ever. And I'm sure that's pretty similar to the NFL, you know, just numbers. Um, but so I guess that that would be kind of the, the most fundamental story to you, kind of the one that, that set it all off, but it's crazy. Like, I'm sure your, your buddy was very intentional with saying it's nice to see you, but it's nice to see, you know, it's like five words, you know? Yeah. But those five words change everything. Mm -hmm. It's nice to see you. Yeah. Like, and he said it. And then a week later, this counselor said it. And then he said, get used to hearing it. And I'm like, what do you mean? You know, he, and he actually was the one who recommended, he said, I don't know if you journal at all, but it, it might help. He said, I don't know if you, kind of if you're a music guy, but like music may help. And so he just said, maybe start listening to music and start journaling. And so I said, all right. And so that day I left his office, drove three hours. And funny enough, I actually didn't drive straight. One of my buddies, his name is Max. He was in town watching a St. Louis Cardinals game, or maybe Arizona Diamondbacks game. We're playing, we're playing the Diamondbacks playing the Cubs or something. And his buddy named Paul Goldschmidt, who's a baseball player uh, for the Cubs, like, or for the now for the Cardinals, but he was for the Diamondbacks. He happened to be in town and he, we both played in Arizona at the same time. And I, I didn't even realize this, but like me being me in Arizona, like he would watch that, whether it was like interviews that I did or whatever, he'd be like, man, there's something about this guy. And we had this mutual friend and my friend was like, dude, y'all got to connect. Y'all got to connect. So after that meeting, I haven't, I, I don't know if I told anybody this, but after that meeting with the counselor, I actually stopped and got lunch with Paul and my buddy, Max, Paul Goldschmidt and my buddy, Max. And, they, you know, they were laughing. They're like, dude, like, don't you have training camp today? Like, shouldn't you be doing more important things? I was like, you don't know where I just came from, dude. I got like, you know, and so, um, and then we hung out for a bit. Then I went to training camp. And I mean, the story continued with even now, my teammates started to see the real me. And next thing you know, I was crying in front of teammates and being authentic. And, and then they would say the same thing. It's nice to see you. Those five words changed everything. And they still do. And so I think that's why you talked about the way that we connected. It was like, yeah, dude, I want to know you. I want to know your story and your background. And like, you know, we're all worth getting to know. And, and it's not to start speaking in sol soliloquies, like everything I say to everyone is going to be like this life changing thing, but you never know, you never know. And just like an intentional question or an intentional phrase. And it's crazy what, what that has turned into and will turn into, you know, those, those simple five words. Um, so that's just a few of the stories that, that hopefully we've, we've inspired the, the audience to go check it out. And then there's, there's a, another quote you had where. NFL players, they have all these people around them. You know, it seems like sometimes the staff on the sideline is bigger than the actual team themselves. But not that many NFL players have a ton of real friends. You know, think about how often their guard is up. People trying to take advantage of them and just all this kind of stuff, you know. And, and I'm sure, like, it was refreshing, like you said, just, like, chatting with Larry, you know. And how many, how many of his teammates do you think in his crazy career he invited over to play chess? You know, yeah. probably not too many, you know. So it's interesting when you get behind the scenes and, and just like authentic stories about being a pro athlete, you know, so, so super cool. So last question that I had prepared is like, what's the secret sauce? How the heck do you do all this stuff? I could I'm ask trying you to the figure same it thing. out. Yeah. I could ask you the same thing. 4.0 and playing baseball in college and clubs. I think sometimes it's 
ooh, I think it is this, like finding those things that, like for you, you were saying, man, like doing these clubs and schoolwork and, you know, playing baseball, it all, it kind of came easy to me. And for me, it was similar. Like, yeah, football, like it was a grind, no doubt. And I had to learn how to manage my time really, really well. That was probably the most important thing during college, time management, because I wanted to do a lot. I was in the business honors program. So it was like the best of the best. And I was on a team. We, were, we went to the national championship. Like we had, we were like my first three years, we were, I think we lost three games total, two, three, maybe four games total. You know what I mean? Like, and so I had to learn how to manage my time really well in college. But then as I got to the NFL, Secret sauce in the book. Y'all go get the book. That y'all get the secret sauce. But um, but as I got to the NFL, I found things that I was like, man, this is easy. And so I kind of just really tried to. The secret sauce is in the book, man. Y'all got to go read the book and get it. I'm just saying, like, I'm just like, a lot of it was learning who I was and who I am and how to be that person all the time. That's probably the best way to say it. All right, fantastic. A, a little uh, cliffhanger. So, um, so. I think we tackled the most fundamental story. So the first one kind of leading you to now. So next, I'll change this one a little bit. So normally I ask, what's the coolest story? And this is, you know, I've heard probably the, the craziest one I've heard, not on this podcast, but I hosted a different podcast. This guy was the athletic trainer for the Cleveland G team, but then they all practice together. So he's, he's by the baseline. It's like the end of a, a inner squad. And LeBron just takes over because his team's losing. He throws on a dunk, picks up this guy who's the athletic trainer, who's like, you know, two, 200 plus pounds and goes, that's right, Tyler. That's how you do it. You know, so I've heard some crazy stories, but what is the coolest story that didn't make the cut of your book that you wish there was just like 10 more pages? I can, I got to rephrase it because every story that I w w thought needed to be in the book was in the book. Um, so the, the cool, but, but a story that didn't, that's not in the book. Let me think, let me think, let me think. Okay, good. So this story, it's not, so this story, it's going to be like in a future book. So it's going to be in a book coming up, but this, cause this story happened as the book was coming to a close. Oh, sneak peek. Yes. Sneak peek. Yes. So, oh yeah. I haven't even told this story yet. So I'm kind of hype about this. Fantastic. So coolest story that didn't make the book only because the book was pretty much finished by then. After kind of all that you just heard and writing the book and finishing that season and you know, all the things I was in a lot of ways, ready to be done playing football. Like I was ready to transition to something different and I didn't know how to verbalize it. And I didn't really know how to do it well, but it was, that was going on inside of me, but I still was training and I still was working out and kind of hoping for a shot. And I got a, I worked out with the saints. I did a workout with them and, and they signed somebody else, but they said, Hey, we're going to be in touch. I went to the bills for training camp and and it ended up getting released by them, which was kind of new. I'd never, usually I'm I always am the guy that makes the team. And then I got released, you know? So I was kind of like in this season and I was even writing the book as this was happening. So it's kind of in this season and, and finished the book, did this, did it, had a workout with another team Broncos. They didn't so I'm like, okay, well, shoot, I'm going to be done. I'm done playing. So this is fun. I really enjoyed it. Let's move on. And my wife was like, man, but I really think that we, like, I, you can still play. And I'm like, well, no one's calling. We've been here for two months. We were in Buffalo at the Staybridge Suites in West Seneca, New York for two months waiting on somebody to call. And I said, let's just go. Like, let's just be let's retire and be done. And though she didn't agree, she still said, all right, we'll go. And so that was on, we had that convo on a Friday. Saturday, we packed up all our stuff. Me and my wife and our three kids were in this tiny little hotel. We packed up all our stuff. And on Saturday, we drove eight hours from Buffalo, New York to Chicago. Cause we had just, the house that <clears throat> had flooded had just been the guy had kind of revamped it and it was for sale. So we actually bought it. So we went back to that house and we said, let's just rent it out to someone. And then we can figure out where our life's going to be. i got a call from a buddy who said, Hey man, I'm in Minnesota. There's this job, you know, I'm starting this company. would love to have you. So I was going to go do that, do some, uh, do some, do, I was just going to go do that, do that job in, in Minnesota, venture capitalism in, you know, he's starting this company. And so that was the plan. So 
like Friday, me and my wife had the conversation. I think he called me randomly. Like I got a call from him like later on that night. And I'm like, well, this is perfect. Answer prayer. So we pack up on Saturday. Like I said, drive to the hotel or drive to our house. That Sunday was the first Sunday all season. Mind you, this is like November. Football season started in September. So like first Sunday in two months where I didn't watch football. Like every other Sunday I was watching the games, but I was so pissed off and frustrated and angry and just, you know, because I wasn't playing. I would be showing up at church on a Sunday instead of being at the game. Like, what is going on? And so I didn't watch. Oh, I'm lying. I did watch. There was one game that I watched. I watched the Bears game because I wanted to see them lose because they just released me. And I watched it at a a restaurant because we didn't have any TV in the house. We just bought it. And so that was on Sunday. And we had a flight on Monday for me, my wife and our kids to go to Minnesota to start this new life. My buddy had a like a place for me to stay, a place for me to train if I still wanted to play football. He got a, had a car for me. To, everything was set up. Yes, everything. And so Monday came and our flight was at like 4 p.m. or so. So we're kind of hanging around. Right around noon, I saw that the flight got delayed two hours. I'm like, all right, cool. We got another two, two, two and a half hours. You know, so I remember going upstairs to like register the washing machine because we just got a new washing machine for the new person who's going to move in there. As I'm up there, I'm with that t- my, my the two-year-old, my son, who was, you know, the two years before had, you know, the complications with my wife. My phone rings. And I don't recognize the number, but I pick it up. Hey, Sam, this is so-and-so from the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Mind you, Tampa, like, was the one team that had, I'd been calling teams to say I'm available. And they were like, we're good. Everyone else was like, we'll see. They said, we're good. We, we like what we got. Not interested. So cool. Hey, this is so-and-so from the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. We know you play outside linebacker. We have four on our roster. Two of them just got injured yesterday in a game. And it's pretty bad. Their injuries are bad. Can you come and work out for us? I said, can I call you back? And he said, he heard my little, my two-year-old crying in the background. He said, um, yeah, sure. I hang up. And I didn't know what to do. Because I had finally decided in my mind and heart, I was done. And now all of a sudden, this team that had already said no months before is calling with what seemed to be an opportunity of a lifetime. What do I do? And I remember just praying. I got almost like, God, like, what, what do I say? Like, is this an opportunity to say no to the NFL, right? And I could go and say, I turned down the NFL. What do I do? And I just felt this like confidence of like, Say yes. Say yes. And so I picked up the phone. I called the guy back a couple minutes later, and I said, I'd love to. And so they flew me out. I go to Tampa. I hadn't been keeping up with them at all because they told me no. I show up, and I knew, like, I knew that their head coach was my former coach from Arizona. I knew that. Bruce Arians, like, he coached me 2013 and 14. But he was the guy who I talked to months before when I first got released, like, eight months before. And I was like, hey, can you, you know, I'm available. And he kind of just like looked at me and walked away, not because he didn't like me, but because there's like tampering stuff that can happen. So I, I was like, oh, maybe I overset my boundaries. I land, not only do I see Bruce Arians, but I see a guy named Roger Kingdom, who was the speed coach back from my time in Arizona. I see a guy named uh, Anthony, who was my strength coach from my time in Arizona. I see a guy named Larry Foote, who was uh, my teammate. Foot is now the outside linebacker coach, the guy who's going to put me through this workout. He was my teammate back in Arizona. And I'm like, what the heck? And it's me and it's one other guy, two of us who are doing this workout. And like I'd done workouts for other teams, as I mentioned, New Orleans and, you know, Denver. And they were okay, but it was like, it wasn't necessarily doing the things that I was used to. But this was like exactly what I knew. This is the same defense I ran in 2013 and 2014. So I was like, okay, this is perfect. Like this could be the opportunity. So I go, me and the other guy, we do the workout and we finish and I felt like it went pretty good. And so I'm like, all right, well, I start to, you know, walk back kind of across the way to the facility to get changed and everything like that, to wait to hear back. And somebody stops me and says, Hey, don't change yet. We need to take you to go do a physical. And I'm like, why? What do you mean? It's like, well, don't worry. Like it's good news, right? We do those with guys we want to sign. And I'm like, this is pretty sweet. But I'm also like, okay, I've been lied to before. So let me just hold my horses. But the dude like kind of winks. He's like, dude, you killed it. Great job. 
So I'm like, all right. So I wait and me and the other guy, both of us actually go to go do a physical. And there was other positions working out quarterbacks and running backs, but only me and this other guy go to do this physical. And so we get in the car, the dude trainer drives us to this doctor and we're waiting, right? Waiting, waiting, waiting. We're going to do x-rays and all the different things. And I remember calling my, my parents, mom and dad and doing a group text with the family. Like, Hey guys, it went really well. I think I'm going to get signed. I'm so excited. And so they're like, yeah, you know, God is good. And so I'm waiting to do the physical. I think we had, we had done like an, I'd done an x-ray, but I was waiting on some other scan. And all of a sudden the guy who drove us, like he picked the call, his phone had rung. Like, and I'd gone to get some food. I'm like, oh, I feel good. Let me go get, I went to like Jimmy John's to get a sandwich. Right. And I came back, was waiting on eating my sandwich. And the guy, this dude's name was Conrad. He's like, Hey guys, we got to go. We got to go. I'm like, what do you mean? We got to get you guys back to the airport so you can get your flights back home. And I'm like, fights back oh what do you mean like we like it's this Tuesday if I'm playing and the game is on Sunday practice is on Wednesday what do you mean fights back oh they just sell, told me they're gonna stop what do you mean he's like we gotta go we gotta go and the nurse the nurse God bless her soul she looked at this it was like an intern guy from the Tampa Bay Buccaneers Conrad she looks at him she says hey you sit down and Sam you come with me we're gonna go get this she was taking my blood pressure we're gonna go get this this scan and I'm like, I'm going with the nurse. And so like, I, the dude was like, so I, I go to the nurse, I go, she puts me in an office and I haven't told the story yet. Like it's going to be in the next book. So this is y'all's preview. Go buy this one. Let the world see you. It's on Amazon. And then buy the next one. It's coming out soon. 2022, maybe 21. I go to this office and I'm waiting for this doctor. And I remember like, not only freaking out, like what the heck is going on, but also praying fervently. I was like, God, like, do a miracle. Please do a miracle, God. Like, I don't know what the heck is going on, but like, this finally feels right. Like, please. And I'm praying and waiting and praying and waiting. And somewhere down the line, I fell asleep on the doctor's table, right? I think I was there for that long. I was probably there for like 45 minutes. I don't know. I fall asleep. I wake up to a knock doctor opens the door he's like hey sam you know ready to do our you know scan or x-ray i'm like yeah sure or, or you know checking my shoulder or whatever he was checking and so he's checking it and i think i asked him if he had heard anything he's like no i'm just kind of doing my test but apparently you guys got to get back to the airport i'm like i'm not listening to these guys anymore right and so he finishes the, the stuff and i i had peace i had peace i'm like god you're gonna do what you're gonna do so he finishes this stuff i get out the the intern guy conrad was super annoyed and pissed off, you know? And so like he, but he's an intern, so he couldn't really do much. And so he gets us in the car and like, I'm not talking to anybody. It was me, Conrad, and then the other guy, the name is Quentin. I'm like, I'm not talking to anybody. And Conrad's trying to like, kind of shoot the breeze and like, yeah, man, well, da, 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 da. you know, and we got to get you guys back. And I'm not like, I didn't hear anything. I just was determined. I don't know what I was determined. In. I was just determined. And so, um, pull back up 15 minute 20 minute drive pull back up to the facility he says he gives us these in our folders that had our results or whatever it was in it he says okay go inside someone from the athletic training staff is going to be there you can give them your folder and then get your bags then we're going to get you to the airport mind you i'm like bump the airport bro shut like leave me alone I mean, I'm like, get you to the airport I said, all right, I didn't even say anything. I just literally ignored him. <sighs> Open the door. I walk inside with my folder. I see a, a lady, I think her name was Stephanie or so. I don't remember her name. And it wasn't Stephanie, but I see a lady standing there. And so I give her the folder. And the other guy, he's kind of right behind me. He gives her the folder. And, he's, and the lady says, all right, cool. Well, thank you all for giving me this. Now let's get upstairs. Let's uh, go upstairs so you can sign your paperwork. And I'm sitting there like, paper, like what paperwork? I'm supposed to go to the hotel. I've, I've, there's no more, I've done work. There's no extra paperwork. I've done what I need to do. I'm supposed to get my bag and go to the hotel. That was going to go to the airport. That was going through my mind. And so she says paperwork. And I'm like, what do you mean paperwork? And she says, oh, you didn't hear? I said, didn't hear what? She said, we're signing both of you. I said, wait, you're what? She's like, yeah, we're signing both of you. I said, no, but the dude in the car, she said, who? I said, Conrad. She said, Conrad? 
man, Conrad's an intern. Conrad doesn't know what he's talking about. No, come upstairs. Let's get this paperwork signed. So I went upstairs. I first I hugged her. Then I hugged Con. Uh, uh, um, I didn't hug Conrad. Then I hugged Quentin, the other guy. And I was like, I was like, dude, this is crazy, so, crazy. So we go upstairs. We sign the paperwork. I ended up finishing the season with Tampa Bay. Played, started on special teams that week. Like started every single game, uh, special teams. Played on defense. Got a sack or so, and and the rest is history. And so that story happened literally like two weeks after I'd submitted the uh, manuscript for the book, but man, like God is so good. It was just a miracle. That is, that is nuts. Definitely, definitely a, a teaser. So thank you for that. Thank you for that. So uh, last two things, I have a feeling what your answer might be, but so it's the X's and O's that bring us together. You know, we're in sports performance training, all that different kind of stuff. But that's not what it's really about at the end of the day. Hence, you know, what we chat about for an hour, what you wrote a book about soon to be another one. So we're all in the business of getting better, you know, for ourselves, for those around us, et cetera, et cetera. If you had to give the listener one question to ask themselves on a daily basis to help them get better, what would it be? Did I love people well today? And I'll make it two. Did I, did I love myself well today? That's probably the better question. Did I love myself well today? Because if you love yourself well, then you can love others, those around you. But if you're not loving yourself well, then you can't love anyone else around you. Yeah, that, that, that's one thing that I've started to learn. You know, all the antitheses of like, um, just I'm assuming that the listener knows what an antithesis is. But when when you're selfish enough to take care of yourself, then you can be who like others need you to be, you know? And when you're not taking care of yourself and you're so concerned about, you know, then you can't be like, you know, the leader of the person. So it's definitely some, some food for thought. And I'll, I'll, add, I'll add on to that. And I'll say, did I let the world see me today? Bingo. I see like I did it. There. Shameless yeah, yeah. plug. <laughs> let the world see you. It's on Amazon. It's a Target. Speaking it's a shameless Walmart. Plugs, yes. I'm now rolling out the red carpet to you. Where can the listeners get more of you? Et cetera, et cetera. The floor is yours. Yeah. So for the book, go to, go to, just put it, put it on Amazon. Let the world see you. If you don't have Amazon, go to sammachobook.com. It's wherever it's, it's, there's, there's uh, links there. Follow me on social media at the Sam Acho, T H E S A M A C H O on Instagram, on Twitter. I'm on Facebook as well. Don't have a TikTok yet. Um, and then also I have a couple podcasts as well. One is called the athletes for justice podcast. So subscribe to that. We share stories of justice and hope in a broken world. Another podcast is called the home team podcast, which is the intersection of faith, family, sports, culture, and social issues. So subscribe to those, buy the book, follow me and, and hit me up too. Like, so we could just be in touch, right? DM me, DM me or, or message me or whatever. Boom. Mic drop. So thank you very much for your time and and sharing these these stories previously unheard and just for everything else so i'm excited to see you and your, your little ones running around the facility next and thank you again for your time awesome thanks matt